Ya que no armó. Ya que no armó. Well, good evening, everyone, or uh, good afternoon, if you happen to be in a hemisphere uh, experiencing that at the moment. Uh, welcome to this very special uh, event, Picturing Climate Change. Uh, it is an international forum, which uh, Street Level are delighted to be hosting. Uh, and that is in conjunction with the climate artists, Sylvia Grace Borda, uh, who we have exhibited and worked with uh, on many occasions in the past, uh, and uh, John Keith Donnelly uh, from Scotland. Sylvia is based in Canada. It also involves the Rural Association of Betterment for uh, agropastoralists, otherwise abbreviated as ROBA, uh, who are based in Ethiopia, Dundee City Council, uh, Quantlen Polytechnic University in Canada, and uh, uniquely in partnership with NASA's Earth Observation Team. So we will hear from representatives from those uh, various uh, agencies who've uh, participated and given their, their time to this event. Little bit of housekeeping. As you know, this is being live streamed to YouTube. We will upload this recording after this live event. It's been live streamed as we speak, uh, and you will be able to share that thereafter. We will add some comments as well uh, round about the biographies and such like. So uh, if you think that anything is missing, 
you can let us know about it. I'm Malcolm Dixon. I'm the director of Street Level Photo Works. And uh, this forum um, is uh, it's supported by the British Council Creative Climate Commission, who have supported Sylvia and Keith uh, in their endeavours. But we are involved because it very much aligns with um, our uh, environmental uh, concerns and recent work that we've we've been undertaking that I'll go on to to mention very shortly. So we have to acknowledge the con contributions of the speakers uh, and the collaborators from NASA, Women for Climate, Dundee City Council, Dundee UNESCO, City of Design, and um, the Quantlin University and Roba. So uh, the event explores the roles of uh, image making, uh, community and engagement and climate communication from the use and adaptation of digital photography to low and high tech scientific and satellite imagery with the purpose of picturing climate change. We will have an opportunity to hear from NASA's Earth observation work and new ways that climate mitigation and environmental stewardship are being supported on the ground through community tree planting, photography and land art. At a local level to us in Glasgow, of course, we'll also get to hear some insights from children into what trees mean to them in a short film that uh, we will screen very shortly. It's fitting that this event um, coincides with uh, United Nations International Day of Forests. Uh, the significance of that is that, uh, well, forests are home to 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity, with more than 60,000 tree species. There's around about 1.6 billion people depend directly on forests for food, shelter, energy, medicines, and income. Uh, rather alarmingly, the world is losing 10 million hectares of forest each year, about the size of Iceland. And you can find all of that information online in the UN International Day of Forests website. So I'm very privileged, therefore, to kind of frame that uh, within uh, the work of street level, uh, as I say, in hosting this event. Uh, so I'll just move into a further uh, explanation as to uh, what we do here at street level. We're a photography organization based in the center of the city and uh, been going since 1989. But recently, we undertook quite a few projects that directly tied in to the uh, COP26 summit that happened in Glasgow in November. Um, and I'd like to share uh, some images with you now. My colleague John will share some of these uh, still images. One, one exhibition that we had on was by um, oh, the renowned photomontage artist Peter Kennard in an exhibition called Code Red. And that title was taken from a speech made by the Director General of the UN in a report which stated that the climate crisis is Code Red for humanity. The work was a wall of photomontages uh, by Peter Kennard, all of which related to that particular theme. Within it, there was a number of uh, photomontages that used the satellite image of the Earth as the essential um, reference point, and in particular, the image that's referred to as blue marble, which was taken in 1972 from a distance of about 29,000 kilometers from the planet's surface by a crew of the Apollo 17 spacecraft when it was on its way to the moon. And uh, it's probably one of the most reproduced images in, in our history. This image is called uh, non-renewable uh, and it shows uh, an oil refinery burning. So if you just run through these images, John, that will, that will suffice because uh, we could say very much these images speak for themselves. Uh, this is called uh, Airless. Uh, the next one is called Spill. And that kind of 
creates a connection between the macro and the micro. Uh, um, this one has earth sitting on a gas stove. Um, my particular favourite here is Rooted, which is particularly salient to this evening's uh, event, which has the earth as an essential seed for the tree with the roots growing out the bottom uh, of the planet. Uh, and the final image um, is called Pull Back, and that is suggesting that uh, we can pull back the clock if we all work together, basically, uh, from that code red for humanity. Running concurrently with that exhibition at street level in November during COP, was Forever Changes, and that was undertaken in partnership with the Nordic embassies with representation in the UK. And it included several artists from those nations. Uh, within that work, we included uh, Klaus Thiemann, who in some sense was the Danish representative. And if we go to the next slide, you can see Klaus's images to the right of this image, which show eight separate locations of various glaciers in different continents. And what Klaus does is use the glacier as something of a barometer of climate change. The exhibition itself had a diversity of work within it, which there's no time to go through at the moment, but you'll find a lot of information uh, on our website uh, about that exhibition itself. Uh, Klaus uh, Thiemann, is also the founder of Project Pressure, um, founded in 2008. And during COP26, Project Pressure launched this campaign to get uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gases uh, categorised as pollutants, basically. That was shown in some billboard sites uh, in the city. So that gives you some kind of context of what we've been doing recently. But... Um, Alongside the exhibitions themselves, we had a fairly uh, engaged series of uh, talks with uh, all of the artists involved in the exhibition. And I'd like to just show you a couple of minutes of a clip from Klaus's talk where he gives a further explanation as to the work of what Project Pressure do. So if you could just play that, John, thank you. Project Pressure is an organization I set up, uh, founded in 2008, and we uh, set up to, to visualize climate change. And we use, um, we use art as a positive touch point. And all of this sounds a little bit so boring to talk about. So I'll try and do it a little bit more entertaining, but entertaining, but it is important because most things about climate change is utterly depressing and you just want to turn off and go bye. But that's not really an option because it's happening and we need to deal with it. So if we can have something that can stimulate people and get them to engage with it, it might actually uh, follow through with some change. I am acutely aware that we don't need more awareness. Creating art about climate change that is purely awareness is uh, past its due date. We don't need more awareness. We don't need awareness about plastic and disease. We don't need awareness about climate change or most of the other environmental matters because we do, we do know what's happening. We just need to act on it. And I'm saying we just need to act on it, but that's what we really need to do. So anyway, so how do we do this? So Project Press is a combination of art, science and education. We use art as a positive touch point and then we try and communicate science and then we try and educate people. If we look at what's been happening around climate change, it's fair to say that science has failed in communicating. So when I started on this project, I was like, well, how can we do something around climate change that can work in a way where it's interesting, but it's also uh, a clean cut that you can't attack it. Remind, remind yourself that in 2008, uh, the people that we now call climate deniers, uh, we call climate skeptics. It's like saying, yeah, gravity. Oh, did that pen just drop? No, it didn't because I don't believe in gravity. Uh, eh, 
that's not really an option. But and you can't really not believe in climate change. It's not something you believe in. It's science. So that gives uh, gives a flavour of the content of Klaus's talk. All of those talks with the Nordic artists are on our YouTube channel, which this uh, this event tonight will be uploaded to uh, also. Uh, the next uh, project we can briefly look at here um, is our Culture Collective project, which has taken place in a couple of neighbourhoods uh, nearby the gallery in Glasgow. This one is in uh, the Gorbals, and uh, the artists who are in residence there, uh, Bash Khan and Stella Rooney, are working with uh, a couple of schools uh, who collaborated on this project by Leaves We Live. So uh, the kids, and it, they're all primary school kids, were all uh, interviewed about what they thought the value and the meaning of trees were. And that's just a shot of the setup. The next one, so that was edited, and then the images were projected onto trees in the gorbals itself. And that then led to the production of the short film, uh, which we will show now. Um, I think it kind of speaks for itself, but it does kind of uh, capture and embrace uh, the, the voices of the children themselves. So if you would like to uh, play that now, John. Why are we important? Well, let me tell you a story. We produce rain and oxygen. We absorb all your pollution. You need me for food and shelter. Trees reduce stress and anxiety. You need me and I need you. They help us breathe and love. Trees give us oxygen and loads of fruits. On a hot summer day, we give you shade. We give you maple syrup. Flowers of a million colours. Life-saving medicine. And they give us mangoes. I love those green spaces and fresh air. We can make you feel better. I like watching the kids play football in the park. Please protect us. I love when boys and girls swing around my branches. I like it when the birds visit. Big trees, small trees, all different kinds of trees. You need us and we need you. Forests, so beautiful. Please don't shock me. I am here to help you survive. So please give me space and life. We have to plant more trees. Please don't hurt me, please don't shut me down. I wonder am I next to be cut down? I enjoy watching the children playing around me. I see my friends being cut down. You have been polluting our land for too long. If you kill me, you kill a habitat. You need me to survive. Deforestation must stop. Please don't cut me or my friends down. Protect our habitats, stop deforestation. We are the present and future. We see everything. They beg you for a long, long time. Please protect us. Yeah, so there we have it, in the words of the kids themselves. Uh, very fitting that uh, it's uh, UN International Day of Forests. And I think that that's, uh, that's a wonderful segue in actual fact to, to uh, this evening's uh, event. Uh, but just very quickly, the title by Leaves We Live uh, comes from the uh, Scottish biologist, town planner and sociologist, Patrick Geddes. Um, and it's in reference to uh, a quote that he made, um, which if I could just read it out. How many people think twice about a leaf? Yet the leaf is the chief product and phenomenon of life. This is a green world with animals comparatively few and small and all dependent upon the leaves. 
So I think that that's really quite significant uh, in relation to green spaces and trees, encouraging people to be active, uh, to be outdoors, produce local food, brighten up and improve the local environment, community cohesion, and a whole number of uh, interlinked elements. So we're going to move uh, fast paced ahead. Uh, it's a very tight schedule. Uh, and um, as uh, mentioned, uh, people will self introduce, uh, they will introduce themselves as they come on screen. So I'll pass this one over. Uh, Sylvia, could you um, assist in who the next speaker will be? Right. Um, I believe uh, that will be myself. I will take on the next part of this conversation. Oh, Mon, we, we have our British Council representative, Monomita. It's a great pleasure to have you tonight. I'm hoping you can give us a bit of an overview to the Creative Climate Commission's which Trees for Life benefited from. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to this picture in climate change. Uh, my name is Monamita Nagchowdhury, and I'm the program lead for the Climate Connection. Um, the Climate Connection is a global initiative. Um, and the British Council have partnered with over 1,100 organisations and schools to really think about a multidisciplinary approach to the climate crisis. So working through education, arts and, and English, um, we've been able to convene partners, bring together ideas and really get that message out there. So it's really exciting that uh, Trees for Life as a Creative Commission's project um, has been part of that journey and really excited to be able to showcase some of that impact as well. Um, I've got a few thank yous as well and to acknowledge some of the partners from um, who've been working on Trees for Life. So this has been um, organised by Street Level Photo Works and Climate Artists. So we've just heard from Sylvia Grace Border, um, but also Keith Donnelly as well. And along with partners, there's quite a few here to mention, but from the Rural Association of Betterment of Agro-Pastoralists in Ethiopia, the Dundee UNESCO City of Design, Kwantlen Polytechnic University Canada, and NASA's Crew Earth Observation Team as well. So um, again, brilliant example of collaboration and partnership. Um, the Climate Connection has actually been running for the past 18 months and reached a high point at COP26 in Glasgow and also in events around London. And we were able to showcase, as I said, a lot of projects through videos, through visuals, um, through websites, through social media. And it really is um, a powerful example of international collaboration, um, really addressing. Um, the climate crisis through climate action, um, working with partners and exchanging through art, science, digital technology. And this event is an example of that approach, um, working with individuals, intergenerational communities, and really working at a global scale. Um, again, just to acknowledge um, all, the, all the different um, intersects when we're looking at different approaches um, from artists, educators, researchers, and how it really is so important to bring all those ideas together um, to you know, achieve climate resilience and really think about future generations, um, both human and environmental. So I'm going to leave it there. If you want to know more about the Climate Connection, uh, there's a website and I think you'll be sharing URLs as well um, for the specific projects. So uh, back to you, Sylvia, thank you. Thank you so much, Monimita. It's wonderful to have you here. And as mentioned, we are a lucky participant um, in the Creative Climate Commissions. We were one of 17 projects chosen to be developed over a one year period. The highlight of it being um, presented at COP. And as our name is sort of present, we can understand that we were part of a project, Trees for Life. Trees are definitely inherent to this project. And so I'm going to start sharing my screen and give you a sense of what Trees for Life is about and where we started and how we've evolved. 
just bear with me one moment here. So as um, has already been mentioned, we have partners from Canada, the UK and Ethiopia, as well as um, partners coming in at a later time from NASA and Severe in um, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. But you have to always wonder, how does a project begin? Where do we start? And how does um, Scotland end up with the dialogue with Ethiopia? And really, it came down to this concept of a creative com commission. How could artists be at the forefront to assist in terms of climate mitigation and the climate dialogue? How could we action something that was quite meaningful? So the city of Dundee, as a UNESCO city, has a high mandate in order to show how design can be applied to different scenarios. And we were very fortunate that a city came on board to help our application win this commission funding through the British Council. And in that dialogue, Keith, who's my partner artist in this project, Keith Dunley from Scotland, approached the city and I approached Canadian colleagues from Kwantlen asking, were there partners that they could advise that would wanna come on board in a collaborative and co-authored creative arts project. And so uh, Deborah Henderson at Kwantlen University suggested that we reach out to ROBA or the Rural Association for Agro-Pastoralists. And what happened is we started this dialogue and the dialogue started to be relational. How do we map Scotland to Ethiopia and Ethiopia back to Scotland? There's distance, there's uh, different hemispheres, but the two actually share something a bit um, in common that is kind of uncommon in terms of knowledge. And that Scotland has the highlands, and Ethiopia also has an area of highlands. Scotland, you could say, has uh, the highlands as locks and lakes and glens and things that are very green and sustainable for tourism. When we come to Ethiopia, there's a degre de degradation of forestry because it's often need for subsistence, for shelter, for food, for animal fodder. And so how do we support forests there when the Ethiopian highlands should be as rich and green as those in Scotland? And so this dialogue started with the concept of establishing a tree nursery. And trees, as has been mentioned, today is the International Day of the Forest, have all these co-benefits, um, great for air, oxygen, cooling, water retention, soil prevention, to name a few, in addition to food, healing, being teachers, beautifying our space, providing wood, and also becoming a marker of seasons and other opportunities. So we decided that um, uh, amongst all the partners that a tree nursery would be central. A tree nursery would actually create sustainability and assist the community at Kofele. And when we started to look at comparative resources, obviously Dundee has a, a fairly large planning department. And within that, you can find all sorts of maps and data and there's layers of how to see uh, trees within the city. It has forestry commission reports. And in some cases, that's not in absence. It's just not available readily within Ethiopia. There's been lots of studies there. But it was this relational comparison that we were able to look at um, the tree pro uh, 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 protection orders that were in Scotland or within the city of Dundee. And we could see how trees had been mapped for a larger city. Kofela is a smaller city and its outlying areas um, tend to be very rural and uh, fall within sort of a, a, a village or a framework. So what we found is that if you were to take your cursor and move around uh, to try and find a photosphere or to find a, a street view of Kofela, none of this could be accomplished. So in actuality, there was an absence of imagery. And in that absence of imagery, we also started to realize there was an absence of dialogue. How can you know places when you don't necessarily have connections with them? And one of the first ways we learn is through visual communication, visual learning. Um, touch, sight, smell, all of these things are really critical. And visual has this kind of mandate of being something that we can articulate, we can talk to, we can experience. And it's also um, a great way to understand and communicate about space. Um, Deborah Henderson at Kwantlen had been uh, to visit her colleagues at Roba and had provided these imagery to show the remote location. So this started to inform the area that we were going to partner with. And also to show that within the highlands, there is a lack of green. In fact, there's a great absence of trees. And so there is a, a high need in order to preserve soil, to, to prevent uh, erosion, 
and to prevent water runoff and flooding to have a much more stable environment where trees are there uh, to help both citizens. So within this dialogue came forward this idea that the tree nursery had to be central. And Hussein Wata, the director of Roba, had had experience in running a tree nursery, but it hadn't necessarily been something that he'd been able to receive long-term funding for. And so it had come and gone in terms of Roba's mandates and operation. So as artists, Keith Dunnelly and I decided, how can we create an artwork with a tree nursery at the center? And also realizing that people need resources in order to help them sustain themselves into the future, we decided that we were going to do something like a Pictionary. We would do a mechanism through Google Street View where you could see interactives of a, an operational tree nursery. So if you had perhaps low literacy rates, or if you just had a quick ability to look on your mobile, you could see how within Africa, an operational tree nursery could be established from seedling to sapling to being planted in the field. And so this was our, our, our main mandate. And we also were very fortunate through our Creative Climate Commission funding that we could send a number of cameras and gear to enable this. So we decided that we would enable Roba and its participants through digital learning, how to create Google Street View materials so that they could actually start to have a presence within a global dialogue and within a global arena. That's the concept. And within this, we also decided that there should be a number of trees mapped in the Kofela area that were mature so that people could understand what these trees were and they could create their own visual tree protection order. They could enable people to understand where these trees were located and what in fact, uh, their long-term benefit was for the community in terms of medicine, food, and other co-benefits. All great ideas. The nursery um, got started and Roba started to acquire a number of seed stocks over a duration of time frame to bring the seeds from uh, seed stock into saplings. However, the camera gear that we were hoping for was still pending in terms of shipping. And Keith and I decided that why we were waiting and the tree nursery was getting more and more established, we should help and assist our Ethiopian participants and colleagues with perhaps doing our own tree portraits. There's nothing worse than asking someone else to do something if you don't undertake that process yourself. What we came to is we created a series of portraits of trees that were within Dundee city, by the cemetery, by the lakes, um, by parks. And these were placed in Google Street View. So this gives you an idea of what this material looks like. We also decided that we wanted the images to be shot from an animal level, not from a human perspective, to really emphasize the benefit of how animals see and move through space. Because if we can understand how an animal that's a 24 seven user of nature is negotiating our urban spaces, we might actually respect and understand the importance of trees for food and shelter to our other co-benefits being the flora and fauna of our local environments. However, as said, we were waiting for equipment to get shipped. And the biggest problem that we started to encounter was one that didn't exist six months before the project proposal started. We found that Ethiopia had changed its government regulations, cameras, radios, phones, computers, anything that was a communication-based resource could not be shipped into Ethiopia. In fact, there was no way that we could get any of our original gear into the country with the current regulations in place. So we were left with a very difficult question. What were the resources? How could we benefit the communities that we were working in a rural setting? How could we bring them into this climate conversation in a way that was meaningful and impactful? And what we recognized was that 78% of people live in rural areas, 40% of people may have mobile connections, but 20% are really online. And so we started to think about ways that we could amplify the work they do. Roba understands trees. It understands how to make a tree nursery function. It understands land rehabilitation. That's its strength. As artists, we understand that we can impact and change how people think about space. And so rather than occupying Google Street View with images of an operational tree nursery, we decided to up the ante. We were going to occupy Google Earth. And it's a different type of picture. If we couldn't get camera gear into the country, 
what if we could allow the trees to become their own picture? What if we could think of trees as pixels? What if plants and trees were configured in such a way that they could shape or form a message that would enable the community to find it on Google Earth and would also allow them to track biodiversity? So Keith and I decided that this might be a good way forward. We spoke to Robo, we spoke to Deborah, we spoke to all our partners, and it was decided that this was a really exciting opportunity to take one of the best resourced media channels and make it work in a very frugal capacity for communities that have very little infrastructure. So we also, as artists, decided that we, we needed to have a philosophy behind this. And we called the work Living Artworks. And what we wanted to also play with was the histories of art. This was our area of expertise. So those who know the works of Marcel Duchamp recognize that he's very well known for the ready-made. And we decided what if, and why not, couldn't nature be its own artwork? We also recognize that, you know, 50 years on the spiral jetty is considered one of the most seminal land artworks produced. What if we could have land artworks that now were there for climate mitigation and adaptation? And likewise, Edward Katz had done in 2000, this mutant bunny, Alba, which had had um, a crossover of different genes to make it glow. What if we could make our ready-made something beautiful that didn't need modification, that could really speak to our natural world and could add to the way that we see and think about space? So we worked on this. And we also worked on the fact that we knew as photographers and climate artists that yes, trees can act as pixels, that there had been this history of something like the anthrotype, which is when you blend juices of a plant to make a photosensitive emulsion, that why couldn't we let a satellite be a, a camera operator for a community? What would be, what would this look like? And so Keith started to draw, because in effect, what we were proposing was to create the world's first earth observation artworks. These would enable the community at Kofela to look as the images got updated in Google, how the progress of the trees were growing, what was the type of biodiversity that was being added, and how was this impacting their local area? Of course, when you're innovating and you don't necessarily, um, no one's done this before, you kind of have to sketch it out and you hope that you can talk and walk people through this accordingly. So we were there for the community and we were going to make the tree nursery really central, but in a way that was quite unexpected. We always have to do due diligence. And so we knew that we needed to look at things like the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. We didn't want to compromise our community. We didn't want this to be misread as surveillance. And you find that within the treaties, things like agriculture, war, and other assets can be tracked by satellite. And these are considered under the UN provision as, as appropriate. So we went on. And Keith and I come from classical train and we knew the grid and the ways things could be put up. So we started to talk to Galata Ammon, who's the digital trainer and photographer for the project in Bofela at Roba. And we sent on some images and we talked about what things should be the form that these tree saplings come forward with. And Hussein right away said it has to be the Ethiopian lion. It's a, an important uh, keystone predator. It's endangered. It's very much part of the highlands. And so we went through looking at something that was um, much more stylized to something that maybe more Western audience could recognize. And it was decided that we would go with a very proud Ethiopian black mane lion. And within this, um, Galata and Hussein and the communities, particularly schools, started to reconfigure the land. They actually recognized that they could grid it and they could take these images that we had drawn up together and we could co-author this world's first earth observation climate artwork. So a lot of resource time went to put this together. And Keith also recognized that for some communities, it can be really difficult to, to work within space, but there had to be also motifs that could be simple. And so we had this idea, what if we could do kisses and hugs for the world? But the idea of a tree circle started to arise and basically a person could be the compass. You could pin peg down, and quickly move around and create a circle, whether it was your foot or with other markers. And so this came forward as a way that might enable further living artworks to be made within Kofele. And with our dialogue with Nora Bashir, who's a Women for Climate uh, graduate, 
and an advisor to the project, she started to say the tree circle, the concept of circle was very important to Gada or to the Ormo community that we were working with. And so suddenly we had come across a very simple mechanism that also had much, much more community uh, meaning than what we had anticipated. And so as the project moved on, Galata Aman was very good at rallying the community to also start making videos. Why these weren't the Google Street Views we had anticipated originally of these older venerable trees, it became much more meaningful that people could talk to their space, they could animate it and describe it in terms of what it meant to themselves and to the wider benefits of the area in which they resided in. And lastly, as we sort of moved through the project, we started to realize that we were coming across a very different way of thinking about space, that when we're picturing climate, we're, we're talking about things that might be tangible. So we had this internet of nature, we had these sequence of tree portraits that were made in the city of Dundee, which unbeknownst to us as a learning tool became really an unofficial city park. We had created a digital park of all of these trees within uh, the city of Dundee. So we had created this virtual park system seen from an animal's perspective, a new thing that had never been done in Google Street View. So we had this tangible, we had a tangible um, functional tree nursery that is outputting 10,000 tree saplings per growing cycle. And we had also created this, this marked up earth artwork that could be found and seen on Google Earth. But the more important part of all of this of these actions were the processes that couldn't be seen. And these were the intangible. These were that each of us brought skills diversity. We each brought our subject expert to the table. And this was quite important because what we did is we did this in dialogue, in learning exchange, all with the shared goal of creating some, a space that could be much more climactic, resilient, and might be an example for other communities to take on. And we did this in a framework of trust and empathy and by us all working and problem solving from our areas of subject expertise, we created something much stronger. So these living artworks aren't uh, a single authored uh, endeavor. They're actually a collaborative co-authored endeavor that is much more about communicate, communi community engagement and people coming uh, on board. And as has been hinted, Part of the process in, in reaching out to other communities that are subject experts on, onto their own, including NASA, as well as Sever, was to look at, could we prove our, our concept? Uh, Google Earth only gets updated so often. So could we have maybe a, a little teaser of what we had done early on so that we could share that with the world? A drawing does so much, but people also wanna see that this, this is feasible. In the latter part of this conversation about picturing climate, we recognize that one of the most important things in terms of understanding uh, heritage and understanding the space of climate is that we need to be thinking about the intangible as much more uh, an active part of that conversation. We need to be much, much more inclusive. And so that equity comes from actually part of the definitions of UNESCO's concept behind intangible cultural heritage. And in particular, it states, that communities can contribute to social cohesion, they can encourage a sense of identity and responsibility, which helps individuals to feel part of one community or different communities and to feel part of a society at large. And it is this idea that being in exchange started to enable, perhaps you could say, a community of strangers that came together because there was a funding uh, element that allowed them to, to, to work and come towards a common goal, but we left and we are a community at the end of it. And so if we can relationally compare how each of us function and how there is a larger narrative in terms of how space operates and how those um, effects impact each other, we probably are going to be in a much better space in order to resolve how to understand climate rather than seeing it as a single image where you could say extract of the snapshot we need to have these layers of exchange because it is that exchange of knowledge and partnership which makes these images much more resonant, resonant and meaningful. And so lastly, this is um, something that comes from the in Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, um, a group at the uh, University College London. They sort of uh, put together some points of how you can create projects that have great resonance within cities 
And this certainly fell, um, this, this sort of mandate unintentionally on Trees for Life, be bold, be inspirational, be relevant, set up a problem to resolve, be ambitious, but be realistic, be cross-disciplinary and drive multiple bottom-up solutions. So we had difficulties getting equipment into Ethiopia, but we were able to resolve it through another digital media channel to occupy. And in a way we gave a community a greater resource to see itself within its own local area and also to be pictured within a global dialogue. And with that, I will take us forward to our next speaker, Hussein Wata, who will give us an overview as to how this was put together. So being in dialogue was part of our success. All of these project partners really put us uh, together. Without them, uh, none of this could have actually happened. We're all equals within this project. And I have to give thanks to everyone here and also to other people that came on board in a supportive uh, role as well, the Lataman, Jamel, and others throughout. Each of us pivoted our own resources. This said, uh, Hussein Wata is in um, Addis in Ethiopia. He's present, he has a, a, a video that's um, available for us to see, and I'll let that get queued up. It will also be available at the end of this uh, presentation for questions. Sometimes um, there can be roaming blackouts or other difficulties in Ethiopia. So this presentation has been pre-taped in order to um, help things go smoothly and to continue the dialogue. So I'll let um, that run. The impact of climate change on agriculture is, is, is multi. One, short of moisture, okay. damage the crops. Mm -hmm. Two, we are seeing new pests and diseases, which, which, which was not known to this area. Uh, we are having wind, which we never seen before. A lot of houses and schools are damaged by, uh, by wind, heavy wind. When we receive some rains, it's torrential drain fluctuation. Rain is not raining in time. The intensity varies. Onset and is changing. Rain pattern is changing. Intensity is changing. So livestock are almost starving. I think if it doesn't rain within a month, they will die. Today, during the bulk, we didn't have one millimeter of rain. So we are at very high risk. We, we are worried of uh, starving. Climate change is occurring in rural areas, especially in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is one of the most affected country in terms of climate change caused by one population pressure, two by land degradation, three by deforestation. So the impact of climate change is in every aspect. There is a change now in the way how we eat food. There is a change how we cultivate. Everything is changing. So we need to manage all this change. If we don't manage, we are losing all natural resources and uh, we are suffering. And yeah, our, our gener future generation will be in danger. I not an artist and uh, I learned about art from Sylvia and the kids. It's new to me, I'm just a farmer. Living art is an art which passes from generation to generation. You draw art on paper, it gets destroyed. But if you plant trees on the ground based on certain art, that tree can stay for 50, 60 years, especially if you plant in schools. And the kids learn in that schools, learn about the trees and learn about the art. Project, project must create resilience and build new skills. Resilience build when the community get awareness about what is happening around them. I think this project has brought different communities together. We have been planting trees for the last 20, 30 years, but we never connected to the culture. We never connected elders with the kids, with the children. To have, you know, generational learning. So by having this artist and including that of digital art, 
writing songs, singing, mm -hmm. organizing mm -hmm. kids, teaching kids about videography, mm -hmm. camera. Mm -hmm. This really put in life into the project. Okay. At the Roba School, we, the artists draw down on the ground mm -hmm. with the kids and the community planted different trees following the shape of the lion. Lion has also symbolic value within Oromo culture and within Ethiopian context. We know how to plant trees, we know trees, but we never connected to the art, which you now motivates every school children to go back to their home and draw art on the ground. Some of them have started planting trees in the name of their their father in the name of their clan. We need genuine partnership. Yeah, connecting generations, the elders and the kids. Uh, yeah, bringing the culture in front of the people. Mm -hmm. The other important is working together and generating ideas about the environment and ecology make the community stronger. The schools, although they have some sort of curriculum about the environment, they don't understand, they don't teach about climate change. In theory, they have art class, but in practice, they don't have facility, they don't have art teachers. Climate change is a challenge to the world, and especially a challenge to rural poor whose livelihoods are depends on the rain and depends on natural resource. By connecting art, by bringing art into project, people are motivated, kids are motivated. As main component of development, without culture, no development. People without culture cannot cannot be called a community. I want to see a community, organized community, who has culture, who know their dignity, who think of their future and their future generations. There is a lot of indigenous knowledge which are very critical, critical to the success of the project. Living Lawn Art is a legacy. Living uh, Three Circle based on Gada structure in different schools is a legacy. Even when the project phased out, the kids will say Roba Lao. The kids will say Three Circle. So it's a legacy. We are putting legacy in the young kids. So with each speaker that comes, we're going to build on these knowledge partners. Hussein has given a particular perspective, and that's what's, is what's really interesting about for Trees for Life, is about working in a multi-perspectival way. So our next speaker will be Noura, and she'll give you a better overview as to some of the climactic conditions that Ethiopia faces. Noura, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Okay. Uh, so my name is Nuram Hamidat Abbasha, and I am the a landscape designer as well as an urban designer uh, with a background in urban planning. Uh, we have joined our forces with Sylvia and have been working on how to bring about the Tree for Life project in Addis Ababa, in addition to the uh, Kofele site. Uh, so to start with, maybe a quick understanding and introduction of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a landlocked country located in East Africa, and it's one of the most uh, fastest uh, growing uh, economies in, in uh, today. Uh, it ranges from the Ethiopian highlands to the the Nikel Depression and to the uh, bustling and busy cities of Addis Ababa and other cities. And um, climate change, as Hussein also mentioned, uh, is becoming more uh, 
evident in our country, in Ethiopia. And according to the uh, climate change risk in Ethiopia fact sheets, uh, temperature is projected to increase by 1% to 2% by 2050. Um, erratic uh, rainfalls and increased unpredictable uh, seasonal rains is also expected. And droughts and very like extreme events are also predicted to happen. Uh, in addition to all this, uh, we have seen the changes in the impact of uh, climate change here in Ethiopia and uh, Addis in particular as well. Uh, so the Ethiopia has been working on different initiatives to combat the climate change effect, uh, such as the Green Legacy Initiative in which a tree planting campaign aimed at curbing the effects of climate change and deforestation in which uh, for the past two or, th uh, two or three years, there has been a, a tree campaign of planting a, of a, a few billion uh, trees uh, as a national movement. Uh, have, there has also been a project called Beautifying Sugar in which the government is uh, aiming to clean rivers and create public spaces in the capital of Addis as well as uh, three selected uh, cities within the different regions of Ethiopia. Uh, there's also the Grand Renaissance Dam, uh, which is a hydropower project. In addition to that, uh, Ethiopia has, also has the clean resilience, the climate resilient uh, green economy uh, initiative that is provides a blueprint to achieve a middle income status by 2030 without increasing increasing the greenhouse gases. And moving on to the Three for Life project, um, we are currently in the process of uh, executing a three circle within the uh, the Gulali Botanic Garden, which is located at Addis Ababa. It is a 700 plus uh, hectares of land, uh, which is used as a conservation as well as recreation. Uh, so we've been working on how to integrate the idea of Tree for Life and um, how we can build and construct a tree circle within the compound of the Botanic Garden. So there are different advantages to it. One is that we are creating art within this compound, which is uh, uh, an exciting journey on its own. And not only that, not only just the public, uh, the uh, art aspect, but also why not use this piece as a recreation in which people can just sit down and recreate and socialize and interact with each other. So different sitting areas and different like private and public spaces can be designed within the space. Uh, Ethiopia also has different uh, plants, you know, like uh, different very indigenous uh, species that are being extinct. So it's good to uh, use this plant within the tree circle. And most of the trees also have cultural values in which uh, people in have uh, are to somehow related to it on a cultural value. So integrating these trees within this space is also a great benefit. Uh, also, it's about raising awareness of climate change and environmental issues and sustainability in which we could inform any students. As Hussein, Hussein mentioned, there isn't really a curriculum uh, addressed to uh, climate change, although in high schools and elementaries, uh, most uh, schools have like environmental clubs and uh, other uh, related clubs. But with this, we can also raise the awareness uh, regarding climate change uh, and art as well. And finally, the of this project is that community engagement. Uh, we could uh, a small scale uh, green legacy campaign in which we could have uh, participants uh, have engaged in the tree planting event, uh, which is also very exciting on its own. Uh, and yes, so this is uh, what uh, tree, for, uh, tree for Life has been engaged in in uh, Addis Ababa. So thank you. Uh, back to you, Sylvia. Thank you so much, Nora, for, for giving us that overview. I really appreciate it.
And, you know, each speaker is going to build on how Trees for Life works within their own professional practice and how it's contributing to this multi-perspectival way of creating a, a greater narrative about how to picture uh, climate. And I'll, I, we have a, a fantastic presentation um, that's being filmed by Dr. Mugo, who's from Sevier, and I will let that um, come forward. We're also very privileged to have Dr. Mugo with us today. Um, it's evening in Nairobi, so thank you, Dr. Mugo. Um, there will be a Q&A period at the end in which we can um, start to uh, take questions within that sort of arena. Um, we wanted a little bit of proof of concept, as I had mentioned, and um, there was this aspiration that we might be able to have dialogue with some of the uh, space agencies. And I'll have to be honest with you, this, this led to a lot of dead end emails, but we were very fortunate at one point that there was some correspondence that started and this project was seen as a, as a valuable asset to potentially map. And so I'll let Dr. Robinson uh, Mugo uh, speak to that now. My name is Robinson Mugo. I work for the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development in Nairobi on a project known as SEVIR Eastern and Southern Africa. SEVIR is a Spanish word that means to serve. It's a partnership that we have with USAID and NASA to facilitate the use of geoinformation and earth observation data for development decision making. I got into this through some consultations with uh, Trees for Life project, so I hope you'll appreciate that. But first, the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development is an intergovernmental body. As you can see the map on your screen, um, there are countries that are member states, and we, we have been in operation for close to 45 years now. Um, based in Nairobi, Kenya, and we were formed mainly at the auspices of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa to plan their resources and utilization of their resources better using surveying and geoinformation. We do know that um, the landscape that was Africa 40 years ago is rapidly changing, and that is why we, we know that the population is rising. We are about five to six percent of the global population. A lot of that population is in urban areas. It is constituted of mainly young people. So it's important to really make sure that people have the facts on the ground, both for the environment and socioeconomic issues they are dealing with and that helps them to make decisions in the right way. The map on your right, on the right of the slide, is a gridded population map. And for the light colors, the bright colors, you can see where there is high population density in, in Eastern Africa, around the Lake Victoria Basin, around the Lake Tanganyika, northeast of Lake Tanganyika, and also in Ethiopia around Addis Ababa and south of Addis Ababa, where you have a lot of um, agricultural work uh, going on. Uh, livelihoods are supported mainly by agriculture. And th this is important in terms of planning and utilization of resources, because then you work with people and people are important for conserving the environment because the environment also matters to them. And that brings on board why SEVIR as a project is important. We have a partnership with NASA, the, the US agency that facilitates um, a lot of space work. And this partnership with NASA really builds upon the many numbers of uh, satellites in space whose data is beamed back to Earth and is very useful in terms of making important decisions that pertain to our own livelihoods on Earth. We do pride ourselves with the mantra that we want to connect the space to the village so that we can facilitate um, informed decision making 
at the village level that whatever definition of the village level is. But I'm very happy that in this uh, Trees for Life uh, project initiative, I think you bring out the village aspect of what we do quite clearly, as we'll see in subsequent uh, slides. We try to delve a little bit into this map and what it would mean for the kind of work that uh, Trees for Life is, is trying to, to do. We zoomed in a little bit into this map and what we are trying to show here is location A um, is one of the cities that is very close to, to the schools that um, um, Trees for Life is working with. I think that's Kofele City. Uh, B should be Sheshamane if we got that right. Um, and you can see the other land use types in this area would be mainly farmlands and then you have a, a few forest areas in, in the highlands. Now this is important because then it brings up context into how we are able to interpret uh, this data. So I wanted to uh, at this point now switch um, gears and move a little bit faster to just illustrate using um, Google Earth Maps the locations that were offered to me by one of your colleagues on the schools that you are operating in. Uh, Gurmicho, I think I pronounced that right, then Roba Elementary School and Koma Mamo Elementary School which are somewhere northeast of um, Kofele city. So having uh, brought that orientation on board, then we can delve in closer. For example, looking at the Gurmicho um, uh, before and after. I understand that one of the initiatives of the Trees for Life uh, project is working with schools so that schools appreciate the importance of uh, bringing up trees. So on the image on the left is um, a snapshot from Google Earth images of the Gurmicha school, if we got the location right, I believe we did. Uh, before this, the school developed the circle of trees. And if you look closely on the image on the right, they believe in the in future we should be able to visualize this again in high resolution imagery as as the trees uh, come up. This is Roba School. Um, the uh, rectangle that I think uh, is intended to be visualized here is not very clear, but you can see somewhere in the middle of the classrooms. I think something is happening here. We, you can also see to on, in Komamamo uh, Elementary School, the before and after. If you look at uh, the left-hand corner, upper corner of Komamamo uh, School, on the image of the left, you don't see the circle there. And you look at the image on the right, we have tried to zoom in into that image. You can see a couple of... Uh, um, circles that I believe the students or the pupils there are working out to uh, grow their trees in that. So that's again pickable from uh, high resolution satellite images. This is exciting for us in terms of being able to uh, provide that uh, village context or on the ground context of what is being picked up whether from medium resolution to high resolution imagery, that there is evidence that what gets done with students can also be mapped using uh, satellite imagery. And as I wind up, I really uh, invite you to look up into our portals where we have a number of uh, data sets that we have hosted, some of which you can download and interrogate. And this will be quite useful in terms of um, going through um, the work that we do with SEVERE. Thank you. I appreciate for having your time uh, today. Thank you.
Dr. Mugo, we appreciated having you present. And as I said, this question of, of proving, you know, how do you document an Earth climate observation artwork? Where, where does Earth observation begin? You have to kind of um, wonder where does this where does this all come from? And so we're very very fortunate to have Kenton Fisher here. He will start to describe the role of uh, NASA historically in terms of Earth observation and um, in terms of the types of uh, satellite and other re remote sensing devices that are doing this type of work. So I'll turn it over to you, Kenton. Thank you, Sylvia. Let me share my screen here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see it. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Kenton Fisher. Uh, I'm the lead of the Earth Science Remote Sensing Team at Johnson Space Center. Uh, but just one part of the larger team that makes up our, our group here at JSC. Uh, our team is primarily responsible for the facility known as Crew Earth Observations from the International Space Station. Uh, and I will talk about that in this talk, along with a number of other things about the history of Earth observations from space, uh, the many different sensors and satellites that are uh, studying Earth and the changes going on down here, and uh, close with a little bit about our collaboration with Trees for Life and where you can find more information and uh, free resources. So, like I said, uh, I'm from the group known as Earth Science Remote Sensing Team at Johnson Space Center. There's about eight to 10 of us that work uh, both as Earth scientists, uh, GIS analysts, uh, computer scientists, computational scientists, uh, doing image analysis, training astronauts, uh, requesting science targets uh, for the crew to take images from the space station, uh, working with sensors uh, and payload development teams that are sending up new Earth sensing uh, instruments to the space station. And we all work together in support of the International Space Station program. Uh, and through that, we work closely with researchers, educators, um, folks doing outreach events like this uh, to help spread uh, the data, the great data that we can get from the International Space Station, uh, both through crew Earth observations and other remote sensing techniques. As I said, I'll walk through a, a brief history of Earth observations, a bit about the International Space Station, what makes it unique, uh, some of the benefits of it, uh, the types of climate science research happening on the ISS, uh, overview of crew Earth observations, which is our, our specialty, and then a bit about the collaboration with Tree for Life. So what is Earth observations and remote sensing? Uh, the definition is the use of electromagnetic energy to measure physical properties of distant objects. What we're really talking about is observing an object from a distance and making measurements about the physical properties of that object. In the case uh, uh, for this is Earth observations, measuring the quantities or properties of Earth's surface from space, whether through satellites, whether through astronaut photography, through observations from the crew themselves describing what they see, all of these are types of remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing really kicked off uh, you know, way back in the day with uh, balloon observations, but uh, from space, they really started with kind of the Corona program or, or known as Discoverer uh, satellite program in the 1950s, which is the first uh, platform uh, specifically launched for imaging Earth's surface and, and had multiple orbits that were uh, continuously photographing the Earth. Uh, NASA's astronaut photography, uh, which continues today for the International Space Station through our program, uh, first started with the Mercury program and Mercury missions in the early 1960s when the crew started taking photos of Earth. And that really kicked off the civilian uh, science-driven uh, observations of Earth from space. Uh, Landsat, uh, a very well-known Earth science platform that is still operating with uh, number nine, I believe, just launching a couple months ago, uh, started in 1972 and it's the longest continuously operating uh, series of remote sensing satellites for Earth science. Uh, when we're talking about remote sensing, you know, we constantly think about what we can see in an image, right? And, and as folks know, humans look in the visible spectrum, so 400 to 700 nanometers, but the many platforms that we have orbiting Earth today actually expand beyond that, both into shorter wavelengths and longer wavelengths, like near infrared or infrared, and these can add a, a lot of insights about what's happening at Earth's surface. For example, studying things like reforestation, like in Trees for Life, uh, can be very beneficial when looking in the near infrared because of the reflectance of plants on Earth's surface. Here's an example of all of the Earth science satellites that are currently orbiting uh, Earth and are operated by NASA or in partnership with NASA. Uh, there's a lot here, I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, but I wanted to highlight in red, that middle kind of swoop that comes through are instruments that are operating on the International Space Station. A key difference between those instruments on the International Space Station and everything else listed here 
is that all of these other satellites are standalone satellite missions. That means the Landsat, for example, it has to launch its own satellite with its own power, its own communications, its own hand handling for navigation and orbital adjustments, and along with its imaging platform uh, for, for its remote science sensing. The ISS remote sensing payloads don't have to do all that. They only have to focus on launching their instrument so that they can study the Earth, and they get to uh, work off of the services provided by the International Space Station, making it much easier to launch a payload to the space station uh, than to launch one of these full satellite missions. Here's an example of uh, a subset of those Earth observing satellites in orbit. And as you can see, they're in a lot of different orbits, but many of the ones that we think of traditionally for remote sensing work in things like geosynchronous orbit or a sun-synchronous polar orbit. Uh, sun-synchronous is a big phrase. What it really means is that the satellite is trying to image a specific area on Earth in the same solar illumination conditions every time. So think about it if you went outside and you were taking a picture of yourself, you're trying to do it every day at noon, for example. The reason we, they do this is because if you're trying to compare differences and changes, for example, of your, of your yard out front, you want to take it at the same time every day with the same illumination so that things like different shadow conditions uh, don't make it seem like there's a change on the surface that's not actually there. We're not as interested in, in shadows, right, with that. We're trying to see exactly what's happening on the surface. And so by doing it in like a sun synchronous orbit, you really eliminate some of those variables. The reason I bring this up is if you can see the ISS coming across right now, the ISS is not in a sun-synchronous orbit, it's in a sun-asynchronous orbit, which means that it actually crosses over uh, and can image the Earth in various solar illumination angles, both in daytime and nighttime. The, for those unfamiliar, the International Space Station has been operating and uh, on, astronauts have been on board continuously since 2000, so over 20 years now. Uh, there's always been a crew up there, they're different crews, they switch out, but they all go through the same sort of uh, uh, stringent training regime, uh, regime and learning about things like Earth science remote sensing uh, so that they can support the science that's going on in the space station. There's a lot of science beyond Earth science on the space station. There's a lot of biological research, plant growth, human health studies, um, but Earth science is one of the major players there. Uh, like I said, the Earth uh, ISS is in a different type of orbit. It orbits um, about 15 and a half to 16 times a day, depending on how high it is off the surface. Uh, that's about once every 90 minutes. The crew get to see a sunrise and sunset, nighttime and daytime. Uh, and the ISS is an international collaboration. It is not a NASA-only entity. It is only possible through international collaborations with our many partners around the world that have done everything from contributing astronauts, contributing uh, launch vehicles, contributing modules on the space station, and helping support operations. It is truly an international research laboratory collaboration done for the betterment of humanity. So when you're doing remote sensing of Earth, why use the space station versus one of those other standalone satellites? Uh, like I've talked about with the different uh, orbits, there are other benefits too. For example, uh, you can get everything from nadir to highly oblique imagery. Nadir is just looking straight down as if you looked on the floor right now, straight down. It's a straight on shot. Uh, highly oblique is if you're looking off at an angle. There are reasons to do this, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, also, like I said, it's a sun asynchronous orbit, so you get different sorts of solar illumination, which can be beneficial. And having these different types of data uh, that you can collect on the ISS that are different from other satellites allows it to be complementary. It's not a matter of one being better than the other. It's a matter of uh, completing the data set and having extra types of data for researchers to use uh, that supplement what is being collected by traditional remote sensing satellites. In addition, something that's not often thought about, there's a lot less technical challenges and budget constraints when launching a sensing uh, platform to the ISS, mainly because you don't have to build a whole spacecraft to do it, right? It, it can be attached to the outside of the space station and tap into the power and the communications and commanding capabilities of the space station and just focus on collecting the data. There's a, there's a lot on this slide, I'm not gonna go through it all, but here's an example of the many different external platforms where instruments are mounted on the International Space Station. Uh, one of them to highlight is the GEM-EF on the kind of middle to right, where there's a number of uh, very interesting research payloads like uh, EcoStress and JEDI that I'll talk about later. Um, but what it shows is there's a lot of different um, places that you can place experiments on the space station to look at Earth, and there are benefits and pros and cons to all the different areas. Here's a, here's a bunch of lists of different Earth sensing uh, payloads on the space station. Two that I just want to highlight. Uh, JEDI at the top, um, which is doing laser ranging or LIDAR to study deforestation, uh, very relevant to Trees for Life, and, and understanding how deforestation contributes to atmospheric CO2 and habitat, uh, habitat degradation, uh, which affects global biodiversity. Another payload is EcoStress, uh, which is using thermal infrared uh, 
to study how the terrestrial biosphere responds to change in water availability, how hydrology affects uh, plants on the surface, if you think about it in terms of agriculture, how the plants respond to droughts uh, and, and other changes. That's something that EcoStress is studying. And there's a bunch of other interesting ones, for example, LIS, which is detecting lightning, uh, and is one of the, the most uh, or first the lightning detecting sensors that have been up there for a long time and others like OCO3 and SAGE3 which are actually continuations of previous standalone satellite missions that are now uh, continuing as a uh, payload on the International Space Station. Transitioning to uh, astronaut photography and crew earth observations uh, as I said it is one of the longest running uh, remote sensing data sets of earth. It started in the 1960s with the first manned NASA spaceflight missions uh, and our database has got over 4 million photos of Earth now spanning this whole period, going back to those Mercury, Gemini, Apollo images. We got a lot of images during this era of the space shuttle, and the bulk of our images, or at least over half of our images, are now from the International Space Station. We've been imaging almost daily, continuously, since 2000, when the first mission started. Our group here at Johnson Space Center and Neuroscience Remote Sensing Team uh, provide support to the ISS program, both through our training of the astronauts so that they can do the best sorts of crew Earth observations that they is possible. Uh, we also handle things like imagery requests. So you can go to our website if you are a researcher or an educator and that requires new imagery from the space station. You put in a request, the science rationale or education rationale for it, and our team will review it, process it, create the new target, and provide that to the crew. In addition, we uh, support disaster response. Uh, Myself and another member of our team are members of the NASA's Disasters Program, uh, which also works closely with SERVIR, as uh, you saw in my previous talk, and uh, supports the USGS, which is the US Geological Survey, uh, who are signatories to the International Disaster Charter, which allows countries that are having international disaster, natural disasters to request uh, data products from other countries that may have resources, such as the International Space Station, to provide uh, support. And we frequently provide imagery for disaster response. On board, there are a number of windows that the crew can use to take observations. Uh, on the left is probably the most famous, known as the cupola, which gives you this beautiful 360 panorama of the Earth. Uh, and also, as you can see here, there are a lot of different cameras available to the crews, uh, the crew on board. I couldn't actually tell you how many are up there because it fluctuates, but there's a lot, as you can see in that picture in the middle. And we have some very large lenses, lens that the crew use uh, that get into telephoto, uh, up to 800 millimeter focal length, so that we can get very high resolution imagery of Earth. We also have the complete opposite, which is very uh, sh uh, short focal length image uh, lenses. So we can do things like uh, fisheye shots, wide field of view, as you see in this image on the left, showing the Earth's limb in space in the distance. And so this allows us to really play around with whatever the type of imagery that we need for the, the request, whether we need a really wide focal length shot trying to look at uh, the layers of the atmosphere or something really high resolution because we're trying to see something really fine, like trees that are being planted for trees for life. Uh, so we have a lot of flexibility. Uh, as I said, one benefit of astronaut photography, this is really one of the prime benefits of it, is the ability to have variable solar illumination angles. As I said, uh, satellites like Landsat that are trying to image at the same solar conditions every day, or not every day, but every time they pass over, uh, we can do it a lot different. For example, you've got an image during daytime in the top left, the top right image is either during dusk or dawn, and then the bottom left is actually at nighttime. Uh, nighttime imagery is one of the biggest uh, pros of the astronaut photography database, there are very limited, freely available, high resolution nighttime data products for remote sensing. Astronaut photography can get down to almost five meters per pixel resolution during, uh, depending on the conditions, which is one of the highest resolution or possibly the highest resolution freely available uh, nighttime uh, photography data set. In addition, we have variable look angles that allows us to view, or the crew can view the Earth from all these different uh, viewing angles that is, would be very difficult to do on a uh, remotely controlled satellite. This is a benefit of having an actual person looking through the lens on orbit. They can make adjustments based on the requests that we give and change the viewing angle, the orientation, the zoom, and all that uh, in real time without having to communicate to us. So this is a, this is obviously Italy uh, from a couple different angles. So here's an example of the types of different zooms we can get uh, with the crew. So, and this is where the crew get uh, some autonomy to make decisions on based on the request we make and the training that we give them on how to get the best image that we need. So we're looking at uh, the eastern coast of Italy. We're gonna be looking for an image of Venice here. We start zooming in with a little bit uh, more zoom, look at the bay, start finding Venice. And here you can see we can get all the way down to much higher resolution. 
Um, if I wasn't on a presentation and we actually saw the high-res version of that bottom right, you can start seeing individual streets, right? So you can go all the way from images where you see all of Italy down to seeing individual streets, which is a great uh, variability in the data set. Our team here at the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Group, we, like I said, we train all of the astronauts that go to the space station uh, for NASA, and we train them on how to do Earth Science uh, remote sensing observations. Uh, they learn from another group that is uh, partnered with us on how to use all the cameras and different lenses and change the settings. And we provide them education on the uh, different types of science that we are doing from the space station. Uh, things like you know studying climate change, things like studying atmospherics, doing disaster response. Uh, we give them this training so they have an understanding of what the data that they're looking for um, and also so that they can make decisions on the fly on how to get the best types of images that we need. Uh, we also provide them daily targets. The crew members are very busy on the space station every day. You know, almost every minute is planned out for every day that they're up there, and they have a lot going on. There's a lots of different types of science happening, and so they can't generally sit by the window, right, and just wait for hours on end to get the kind of photo that we need. So we look at uh, the ISS orbit tracks, and we look at when uh, ground conditions are are going to be good. For example, we don't want to tell the crew member to come over, look out the window, get all set up, and try to take a photo if it's overcast and cloudy and you can't see the ground anyway. So it would be a waste of the crew's time, and it would be a wasted effort. So we we look into things like ground level weather conditions, the ISS location, viewing angles, uh, the lighting conditions. Like you know, is it going to be nighttime, dusk, daytime? and what the requester, what the uh, researcher asks for, what type of images. Because I may ask for a certain type of image as a researcher, but I don't want nighttime images. So it doesn't matter if we could get a great nighttime photo, it doesn't work for what the research I'm doing. So we, we factor all that in when we provide the crew their daily messages. Types of science we're supporting with our imagery is everything like change over time for uh, climate change and, and land cover change, uh, things like urban growth and light pollution. Uh, this, these two B and C, the urban growth and light pollution, are one of the strongest points and actually I think over half of our science requests now are for nighttime imagery. Uh, you think about it if you're looking at an image of a rural area that's mostly farmland at night it's going to be basically dark uh, but once you start building up adding more roads maybe you uh, pave over some fields and build uh, shopping malls or, or uh, parking lots they start adding light is being added so people can drive at night and suddenly you have artificial light present that will show up in an image from space and you can start to study how things like cities are growing and where they're expanding. In addition, like I said, we do a lot of disaster response uh, to wildfires, to uh, hurricanes, uh, flooding responses. We had an example in South America where there were uh, a lot of floods going on. We got images from the astronauts. We georeferenced them. We sent them out to the International Disaster Charter. They made it to the uh, people working on the ground in South, uh, South America, and they were able to actually figure out what parts of the city they needed to send their responders to first based on the flooding shown in the images. Here's an example of the type of data for wildfire, right? And what we do is after we get an image for disaster response, we go through a process called georeferencing. Uh, you see this image on the left. We got a nice image of these wildfires and the smoke plumes, but it's hard to tell exactly where, you know, what we're looking at, where on the ground it is. And so what we do is we go in and do these transform uh, transformations and alignments and scaling such that the image can be fit and projected on something like Google Earth or some other uh, mapping platform. So first responders and people at the ground level that are using the data can actually know exactly what they're looking at and where things line up and know where that fire is. In addition, like I said, we were doing uh, land cover change and climate studies. Uh, we've had a long standing target in Southern Patagonia and Argentina studying glaciers. Here's a sequence of images showing in the top left from 2007, uh, then 2016, top right, and bottom left, uh, 2018. And you can kind of see it's hard. It might be hard without a, a pointer, but uh, the glacier has been retreating uh, back around that bend as uh, glacier mass has been lost and ice has been lost. And what you can do with these images is, is map the current extent of a glacier. You can look at uh, the rate of change, the rate of loss uh, and retreat of that glacier by looking at when the image was taken and where it is. You can measure that distance and then look at the time that has passed and understand how quickly we're losing it over uh, X number of years. And so you can do a lot of different types of research with this uh, data. Another example of land cover change is these Toshka Lake sequence. Uh, this is one of our favorites to show. Uh, that image on the top left is on uh, from 2001 and the fourth fourth mission to ISS, so one of the very first. And as you can see, these are, are large reservoirs used for uh, irrigation in Egypt. And as you transition through the years from the top left, down that left side, back up to the top right, and down the right side to 2015, there was a huge loss of water volume in these reservoirs. Uh, this is a place that experiences rapid evaporation, 
um, and there's possibly uh, you know, a drought going on that reduced the inflowing water to the reservoirs or possibly uh, changes in management practices for the water uh, itself. However, last year we ended up getting a very nice image in the bottom right that shows that these reservoirs have refilled. So it may be changing, you know, maybe a drought was broken in this uh, time, maybe uh, water management practices were changed. Either way, this is something that you can track from space to see how it's changing uh, through our astronaut photography. In addition, like I said, we partnered with the Trees for Life group uh, and project and wanted to show some examples of Ethiopia from the ISS. Uh, this is a great image to also talk about beyond the science and educational aspects of astronaut photography from space. There is a natural uh, beauty to the images that uh, really resonates with the public. Uh, this image here, I think, is, is really just a beautiful image of the East African Rift Valley and the Blue Nile. Um, and you can really just see, uh, you know, the presentation doesn't really do justice with the resolution. If you go to our website and look at the really high resolution images, it's just stunning what you can see in these images. And it helps uh, tie both the public back to the planet and also the astronaut crews back to their home on Earth. Um, one of the earliest slides I showed, which had a picture of Earth on it, as Malcolm introduced earlier in the, uh, earlier in the uh, session, was the blue, uh, blue marble image. One of the most famous images of last century uh, but it was taken on a mission where astronauts were going to the moon, and yet one of the most famous images is looking back at Earth, at the home planet, and looking at the beauty of our of our home planet. And so it's something that you can really get out of these images that is may not be as present in other sorts of remote sensing data products. In addition, here's uh, the Ethiopian Rift Valley lakes, uh, and the Trees for Life location is actually just uh, to the south you know, southeast of this area. Um, and so an example of some of the areas that are nearby where we're gonna be trying to get images for the Trees for Life project. Uh, and another example of the kinds of things that you can see uh, from the ISS. So like I said, we've created a new set of targets for the uh, Trees for Life project uh, that have been now been getting sent up to the space station crew. Uh, so as conditions align, as their schedules align, as we have good opportunities, uh, we're gonna try to start collecting uh, high resolution imagery of these areas in Ethiopia so that we can provide them to the Trees for Life project and also uh, host them on our website. Uh, multiple, you know, the idea is that we'll keep this target open for multiple years to try to get images as these uh, trees grow and as the area changes to try to track that. In addition, I only have a few more slides here I want to close out with about some of the freely uh, available resources for the, for the public to look at. Uh, this is our portal called the Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth. You can visit it at uh, eol.jsc.nasa.gov or just search Astronaut Photography of Earth and it'll pop up as one of the top hits. Uh, and here you can see, like I said, our over 4 million images of Earth taken by astronauts. And this ranges all the way back to the very first film cameras from Mercury, Apollo, Gemini, all the way up to images that were uploaded yesterday from the crew that are currently taking them on the space station. Uh, we have a lot of things on there, uh, extra resources, collections, you know, things of images of volcanoes and lakes and glaciers, uh, favorite images by the crew, favorite images by our team. Uh, you can go to the search and search for, you know, search for your town, search for your country, search for whatever you know, you're interested in, see what images pop up. Uh, you can also find a lot more in, uh, educational information about our project and about the space station and links to other uh, space station pages to learn about those too. Also, if you are a researcher or an educator, you can go in and request new imagery here uh, through the request new imagery button. There's a form to fill out. It'll come to our team. We'll review it and uh, decide whether it's a worthwhile use of the crew's time. And if it is approved, uh, it will end up adding to our list of targets, just like the Trees for Life project was, and we can start trying to get images for you. And finally, I wanted to give a shout out to NASA's Earth Observatory. This is ran out of Goddard Space Flight Center, but we've had a great partnership with them for over the, over the decades. Uh, and what this is, is kind of a public education, public outreach uh, page, earthobservatory.nasa.gov, that shows Earth uh, remote sensing observations, whether they're images, whether they're other data products uh, that are, show the beauty of our planet. And also they're accompanied by a, generally a one page article giving some background information about what you can see in this image and about what is uh, being researched with this image, what, what is on the ground and, and what you can um, really get out of it. I think this is one of the best ways to start diving into the different types of Earth observation data that's available to the public uh, because it gives a lot of good information. The images are really beautiful. They're, you know, they're kind of curated and handpicked to the best images from both our set and from other you know, things like Landsat. Uh, and specifically for the crew Earth observations, we provide an article to this uh, once a week. So you'll see ours popping up there all the time. 
Uh, and it's a great way to dig through and find lots of beautiful images. And uh, with that, I'll end my presentation. And, and once we get to the question session, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Gosh, thank you, Ken. That was gorgeous. And it's wonderful to see how NASA and your crew sort of function within and the training. I think the training is really very valuable because we don't necessarily consider on this part, you know, a civilian set, you know, the resources that are needed. We will come to a, a conclusion and we'll move on to questions. Um, John Gray is here with us from Dundee City Council, and he's going to give us a bit of an overview um, and concluding remarks. John. Well, it's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure and honour to be involved in this project, uh, Trees for Life. Um, my role is public art in, in Dundee and uh, I work for the planning department. So uh, to be involved in something that goes outside the city boundaries is quite extraordinary in, in such a way. Um, it's, uh, it's been fantastic to sort of have a, a, a project actually in Dundee and that was the Internet of Nature, which was done by Keith who provided a whole series of uh, lovely photographs of all our parks. And I'm hoping that in future we'll try and get that all repeated and uh, so we continue to monitor what's going on in our public parks. Public parks are still effectively the lungs of the city, as Gaddis once said. Um, thinking about what uh, we've been, uh, all the uh, speakers today, uh, things they've said, um, Sylvia asked, how can artists be at the forefront? Well. I think artists can be a, a catalyst for rethinking and reintroducing difficult and complex um, uh, uh, problems and, and different su subjects. Uh, and, and then even re-inspire communities to become much more involved and take action to find their own solutions. And hopefully that's what we're seeing through uh, Trees for Life. Um, Hussein, uh, 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 tells us about the terrible drought that's going on. That's um, very worrying. He also um, shows how the arts, um, particularly uh, digital media, uh, can be used in a cross-generational divide and uh, used to as a, a cultural way to create an understanding and, and legacy. Um, it's something we, um, we don't um, think about a lot, I think, I suppose, in some ways. I would, have thought, I would have thought about it more in public art, but uh, um, um, it's, it's uh, interesting from the uh, perspective of getting uh, young people to continue to plant, plant trees. Nura talked about the millions and millions and billions of trees that have been planted in Ethiopia um, through various exercises. And, and it does no harm and it does good to re-inspire, I think, people to continue to plant trees through projects like uh, Trees for Life. Um, I mean, she talked about many uh, extraordinary in initiatives in Ethiopia, um, but it, I think it's really important, and I think she mentioned it, that it's really important to have that community engagement so that they continuously uh, are inspired by what is, uh, 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 what is happening ar around them to combat climate change, which is really obviously going to affect them. Affect them. Um, and I'm really pleased with the beautiful uh, tree cycle design that she's created for Gullion Park, uh, Botanical Gardens Home. Uh, I think that will help to um, keep the story and the legacy going. Um, I think one thing that Dr. Robertson Mugo says is uh, connecting the space to a village. And it's fascinating to see the connections between what he's talking about and what Kenton was talking about. Um, we tend to think the information that we get from satellites is probably just goes to various institutions and is of, uh, not really readily available to the ordinary public. But Kenting suggesting very much the, um, the opposite is talking about um, the website that NASA has that we can delve into millions of images, and I'm certainly going to be doing some of that. Um, the, the, I think it's also interesting that... Um, you know, one of the things he really, uh, uh, Dr. Robertson Mugo really pointed out was to creating, uh, uh, connecting space, all the modern technology up there with the smallest and uh, remotest villages that you could find, say for instance, around like sort of uh, Kofali. So um, 
I think it's been fantastic, all, all, all that we've been told. And seeing the stuff from the, the, the space station has been completely, is quite extraordinary. And uh, all the camera and gear they've got up there is, is quite something. Um, but it's interesting from the point of view, it's the continuous recording and continuous sort of uh, watching for the changes. I think that's, that's really the value of what they're providing. Um, it's all right to take a photograph, but you don't know whether how much has changed at all, unless you see it with another one. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think it's been a really good exercise, a really good project, and I really would like to thank all the people who spoke tonight. And I would like to thank um, uh, the British Council for the, uh, to uh, allow us the, to provide the funding for the project. I would like to thank um, my own council for allowing me the time to uh, administer the project. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Deborah Henderson from uh, Quantlin University, who's managed to sort of get to uh, do a lot of help and advice to, to Hussein Wata in Roba in Ethiopia, and Hussein himself for all the work he's done in order to, um, uh, 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 you know, plant all those, get those things going, all those tree circles going. Huge amount of work. Um, it's been really, it really has been uh, fantastic. Um, so, I would like to just end there and just give my thanks to all the speakers. I think it's been very inspiring. Thank you, John. And I appreciate those closing words. And I have to say on behalf of the entire uh, Trees for Life group and partnership, we are absolutely thrilled that um, Kenton and, uh, and Server could come on board. We had asked for a single imaging request, not recognizing that we would have continuous imagery. And that is so beneficial. That will help the community understand how to connect space to the village. And that is a tremendous gift. So we have to extend our thanks there. I'll turn it over to Malcolm, who will um, begin the Q&A session. And uh, we look forward to your comments and thoughts. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm so glad we are recording this this evening because there's so much in this event that I would like to go back to and ingest and absorb. It's been uh, eye-opening. It's been very, very inspiring. It's great to get, uh, oh gosh, uh, an insight into the, um, you know, what NASA actually does because it's something of a mystery. And as John has said, and as the whole event implies, that connection between agencies such as NASA and what is happening at a community level is so fundamental in how we go forward. I um, just to add my couple of comments, you know, I uh, loved what Noura was saying about uh, the tree planting and the, the, the involvement. Uh, I've mentioned Kenton, absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, Dr. Robinson uh, Mugo, I love that reference to things at a village level, which goes to kind of reinforce uh, a tenet that we have uh, strongly here about the local being the international and everything starts at the village level. And that kind of relates to what Hussein was saying about people without culture cannot be called a community. And there's just been so much that's kind of resonated with me tonight. But I'd like to ask a question uh, that's come through. And I guess, um, this might be for Sylvia and uh, Keith. Uh, briefly, how did you test the artwork for Google Earth before making it? That's, that's a really valuable question. Um, I mean, you know, there isn't a manual to Google Earth. Um, we didn't have the resources and attachment um, to a larger scientific body. So often when you're working in the arts, you're trying to problem solve. And that really 
involve looking at um, how far could you drill down in Google Earth. And so I went to a series of remote islands um, that are adjacent to Vancouver. I tried to call on colleagues who had friends in cabins, and we started to measure out what we could see on Google Earth to porches, to fencing, to anything, so that I could get a sense of scale. And then it was also Hussein at Roba who gave us a sense of how and what he could do to scale the work within the land and the commons that was available to him. And to give you a sense of scale, um, approximately the spiral genity in width is four meters or uh, approximately 15 feet. The works that were planted by uh, the community that Hussein has worked with and guided um, are between 30 and 50 meters wide. So we were really looking to, to, to create scale in a way that we could hopefully find it later on Google Earth. As I said, the call out to, to NASA and Severe was done in a very tertiary capacity. We didn't have any expectations that we might be, um, uh, our request would go through. So we had tried to hack Google Earth for the benefit of communities working in a very frugal capacity. And this said, Hussein has um, a, several comments he, he would like to take forward in terms of the tree circles. So I'll turn it over to Hussein. Hi, thank you everybody. My name is Hussein. I'm the founder and director of ROBA. ROBA stands for Rural Organization for Betterment of Agropastoralist. I come from extremely rural village. When I went to school, there was no road. There was, there was no even transport. We have to use horseback and travel for two days to go to high school. Then I finished school, I, I got a good job. Whenever I go to village before we start Roba, there's a, there was no single tree in the area. Trees have gone completely. And the community asked me, how can we start planting trees? How can we get fuel? That was the first question. Traditionally, people use uh, animal dung, they dry and burn it. During rainy season, you can't dry. So trees have gone. During rainy season, the community cannot use. So they challenge me. I have agricultural background. Ask the community to start tree planting. I supported with some seeds and some materials, and they start by themselves. That was before 25 years. If somebody helped him to go back and take the image before 20 years and compare with current, there is a big change. I hope through Silvia will get assistance. So coming to Roba, Roba is a local NGO initiated by local elders. I was one of the, well, educated person who went out of the village. The elders called me back say they told me we educated you you have good opportunity we are in dark we have no school we have no clinic we have no even fuel to cook and well power is not there still we don't have power we start three nursery and we went into rural development it's abroad we involved in water supply health you built schools you built clinics we start projects, we get fund, we stop, we get fund. That's how we run for the last 25 years. Coming back to tree for life, we have been planting trees for the last 20 years. What makes this very interesting is one, it gave us network and connections. I never seen Sylvain face, I never seen John. But because of the trust between us, Sylvia, Kate, John from Dundee City, Deborah from KPU, without seeing each other, we just built a trust and we start working together. Sylvia and Kate with the art. I'm on the ground, I know the village, I know how to grow trees. And Deborah, she's a scientist, she also helped me in how to run nurseries. So the most important ingredient in this project is the combination of art, culture, science, and education. 
The other important, like sugar in tea, is the addition of art into the project, connecting the kids with digital art and connecting the kids with cultural art and tradition, the elders. That really motivated people. And I'm, I'm very happy today to see Nas to talk with NASA and connecting my small village in Kofale, where we don't have even uh, electricity and telephone doesn't work properly. So this connection can change the world. Millions of books have been written, written. NASA has been to moon collecting all these excellent imaginaries. But we have a problem into connecting this together, science, art, culture, young and elderly. So with Three for Life, we touched everybody's life. In rural area, people cannot live without tree. A source of energy, a source of construction, a source of furniture, a source of medicine, a source of light and source of fuel. So I just watched the film, We Live by Leaves. The same kids in UK sing what the kids sang in Kofale during the celebration of Triple Life. So the barrier is the networking and connection. If the world united and connect, we can change. This is a small village. We are magnified now through this networking. And if all the projects are monitored like this and available to people, people will be motivated. Millions have been spent, but no, nobody monitors. Projects come and go. Usually a lot of international projects do not connect with culture. And uh, I think Nora has spoken a lot, Sylvia has read a lot. My conclusion is the world has to unite in solving climate change. Climate change is not one country business, or it's not North America, or it's not Africa issue. It's world issue. It's issue of every person in the world. If we connect and coordinate like this small project, and every child learn about tree planting and the use of the trees. Every household on the rural village plant trees. It's not only planting, taking care of trees until the tree matures. The world will change and will be able to create res res resilience to the current uh, climate change problem. That's I just want so, to... Yeah. I just want to thank Sylvia, extremely energetic. She motivated me, she motivated the kids from Canada at local village in Kofale. And I also uh, thank Kate who supported Sylvia. I would like to thank John Dunde City who has taken a lot of time and energy to transfer the fund and support us. And I would like also to thank Dr. Debra, who supported me in all aspects. Debra has been to Ethiopia and, and she has seen how those rural villages look like. I would like to thank everybody. And if there is any question, I'm glad to answer. Brilliantly put, Hussein. Thank you very much. So a uh, very brief uh, response. Uh, Kenton, you would like to make here to Hussein in terms of that, that, that connection. Uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about uh, Zoom here or these online platforms is that it does connect us continents apart, times apart, in other ways that, well, just wasn't really possible before. But anyway, very briefly, Kenton. Yeah, um, it's interesting, you know, like I said, with the International Space Station, it's all built on the idea of international collaboration with it's not just a NASA mission. It's not just a, a mission by a specific country, it's, it's a collaboration with many, many different countries around the world. And so it's really built on this whole idea of connection uh, across the globe. Uh, in our own group, the Career Earth Observations team, you know, the requests that we receive, it's, you know, it's not just, you know, American requests, for example, for data, we have requesters from every continent, except for Antarctica, but every other continent, right, uh, asking for data, 
Uh, we work with people, uh, researchers all across the globe. We work with projects like this all across the globe and, and educators. Uh, and so it's really, you know, the idea of uh, this global connection in terms of earth sciences is an important thing to understand. It's something that NASA really understands and pushes for these collaborations and, and especially through things like Servere, right, where we're working with uh, both NASA, USAID, and local uh, officials to try to uh, make a change at the ground level. And so, you know, it, it's a big it's a big deal both at NASA and in the earth science community to look at these connections across the globe. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Kenton. Uh, could I just, uh, I think uh, Dr. Mugo is rushing off at the moment, but would like to interject. Um, are you there? Um, to make a comment or um, ask a question? Yeah, not much for me, uh, Malcolm, but to yeah. thank everybody for the opportunity to uh, have an, a word or two on what we do. But it's also been a very informative session for me to catch up on what's happening in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is one of our member states. We have colleagues and friends we work with in Ethiopia. But this has brought a new dimension for me and what, what we do in some of these countries. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I have to drop off, but it's been very exciting to, to listen in to this session. Thank you and That's good night. Wonderful to meet you. Yes. Good night. Bye bye. Thank okay. So, uh, Sylvia, would you like to uh, come back on here, perhaps? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just very briefly, we need to wrap up because there's a, a, another event happening very soon. Um, do you think other people can create living artworks? And definitely. if they can, how can yeah. they? Yeah. It's a really valuable question. I mean, definitely Trees for Life was designed in a way to be a global example. And as Hussein and Kenton and Dr. Mugur have pointed forward, it's this idea of collaboration, networking, and kind of problem solving to create this climate resilience. So the, the aspect of um, Trees for Life was really about tree planting, about working across a landscape and planting uh, material into the ground. And this can be herbs, this can be small shrubs, it doesn't have to be something to the scale of 30 or 50 meters. We chose uh, particular shapes and forms that were emblematic of the Oromo culture. And in part that would build this kind of um, new community appreciation of what was uh, within their own backyard. Ironically, when you do this type of work, it is only available by satellite. What you'll see at the ground level is simply a, a parkland like Noor is establishing a tree circle in Addis at the National Botanic Gardens. It's only through satellite can you actually see the form. And it's those forms that we wanted to be really culturally relevant to people. Because when you go on to Google Earth, a lot of things start to blend at a certain resolution to look like something else. So the invitation is there for people to, to take this methodology, to go out, um, choose a form, plant it in a certain area, work with councils, work independently, find areas that are the commons, you know, approach developers in whatever location you are. You don't have to have high tech. What you do is you need to have a good example. And so we hope that this project enables other communities to see themselves as relevant in the climate dialogue and that they have climate hope on their side, that there are things that we can do. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to wrap up, but I'd just like to say um, you're an absolute inspiration, Sylvia. Um, and thank you very much for bringing this project to street level for us to host this event tonight. What this has tied together uh, are the presentations that lie in partnerships, and that is of various scales, community engagement and activating imagination to address climate change. So that uh, bringing together of creative expression, local knowledge, and the power of nature itself is just so very important. I think that's been reiterated several times throughout people's presentations. And as Hussein also said about the children in the gorbals sounding um, very similar to echoing concerns to uh, children in his area. I mean, that, that's so 
very important that we all are one and it is our voices that we can amplify across different levels that has to make that systemic change that is so fundamentally needed that moves the political procrastinations at work that stops things being done because we all know it's an urgent situation. So I think we will now draw this to a close. Um, Sylvia, is there anything I've missed or will we just say cheerio to everyone? I'm sorry. Um, given that we have quite a large team that is also lurking in the background, uh, if we can ask for everyone to just turn on their video and do a final wave. Yep. Um, in particular, we have uh, Deborah, is we, I think we had Deborah. Nope, we may have, uh, Deborah, thank you. <laughs> we have Deborah, who is um, from Kwantlen um, University in Canada. We have Jamel, who has been instrumental in helping um, negotiate some of the equipment. So while we had an equipment um, uh, scenario and we talked to local ambassadors and others, Jamel was the conduit who actually found a way for equipment to make it into Ethiopia rather uh, with some serendipity and uh, surreptitiously. So it wasn't uh, necessarily confiscated. And those things you don't get to say loudly, but we, we, we owe a great thanks to Jamel for all his efforts and for networking a way around what was a great hurdle. Keith Dunnelly, who is here, um, who has been the founder, the source of the Internet of Nature and really doing all these tree portraits that have established effectively a virtual park system for the city of Dundee and choosing to, to, to move the camera to a very different perspective. And I think, you know, it hadn't really struck me until I saw everyone's um, conversation here is we've gone from um, ground level to space. We've, we've mitigated around the human perspective and in so doing, we've actually become much closer aligned in kinship to different spaces and how to understand how to observe and take care of them. So with all these partners, we've been in, in really good hands. And of course, John um, at City of Dundee, John, if you wanna give us a final wave, John who, um, and Kenton as well, who worked you know, tirelessly to ensure that we had you know, different dialogue and dialogue that wasn't typical to our, our day to day. And of course, Hussein, who effortlessly tried to get us emails, WhatsApp. And as he's pointed out, this is the very first time that we've actually met physically in real space, real time. It's face to voice to, to, to body. And we've accomplished something really amazing. And that gratitude has to go to everyone. So thank you again for being a listener, for bearing witness to this transformation, and hopefully it inspires others. Let's keep in touch. Good night, everyone.